Um, so I'd like to introduce one of my partners, Dr. Zachary Hickman. He is the director of the Department of Neurosurgery at New York City Health and Hospitals Elmhurst Hospital in Queens, uh, where he runs our neurosurgery program there. He's a member of the department here at Mount Sinai, just like the rest of our speakers. Uh, he trained at Columbia and did a uh, fellowship at University of Miami Jackson Memorial in trauma and critical care. It's been widely published in peer reviewed journals on the various topics in trauma and neurosurgery. Um, and he's got a great talk prepared for you guys tonight. Hello, everybody. I'm um, just going to share my screen here. Give me one moment. Make sure that. While works. you're doing that, just a, just a reminder, everyone, raise your hands. If you're fourth year med students, I'll promote you to panelist. And if we don't have too many attendees tonight, I may just promote everybody to panelist so that you can ask questions during the talk. Can everybody see my slides? For the, then, uh, okay, yeah, that's good. Five so, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna give a little bit of a whirlwind talk on head trauma in particular, and specifically focusing focusing on severe head trauma, as well as management of intracranial pressure and brain tissue oxygen management in severe head trauma. Um, no financial interest to disclose. A little outline of the talk. Um, I'm gonna go a little bit of what the value of neurotrauma education and experience is, particularly for folks that might be considering a career in neurosurgery. Uh, a little bit of an introduction to neurotrauma for those that may be unfamiliar with it, as well as some on the classification and pathophysiology of TBI. I mean, this is a very large topic, so I'll just be kind of hitting the highlights in those areas. And then a little bit about the management of TBI, particularly kind of fundamentals of initial management, um, some fundamentals and, and the guidelines, particularly um, as it relates to intracranial pressure and cerebral perfusion pressure management as well as brain tissue oxygen management. And then if we have some time, we'll go through some cases at the end. Um, uh, but I also wanna leave, make sure we leave some time for, for questions as well. And I know we have uh, a lot, attendees of very different, varying different levels. Um, this is kind of more geared towards, you know, fourth year medical students or um, that might be considering going into neurosurgery. But, um, you know, by all means, um, if, uh, Anybody else that is not as familiar with this has questions, you know, ask away um, either as we're going along or at the end. Um, and, you know, I'll, I'll be going through this relatively quickly, but I'm, uh, you know, I'm happy to share all my slides at the, at the end for anybody that's interested. Um, so the value of a neurotrauma education, um, you know, while we talk a lot about tumors and you probably got some lectures on, you know, functional neurosurgery and cerebrovascular neurosurgery, Actually, the most common neurosurgical pathology that neurosurgeons encounter both in the U.S. and globally uh, from an emergency standpoint is neurotrauma. Um, there's obviously a lot of spine uh, surgery and, and spine pathology that we encounter as well. But in terms of cranial pathology, uh, neurotrauma is by far the most common. Um, it involves both non-surgical and surgical management. And neurotrauma rotations are often um, kind of a period of, of growth for a resident. There's a lot of amount of decision-making that goes into um, the care of these patients. Um, you, you learn a lot about neurocritical care and triage of, of the tra trauma patient as well as a neurotrauma patient. You develop a lot of expert communications with other clinical teams, which is something I'll highlight later. There's a lot of kind of moving pieces and multiple different um, teams that are involved in taking care of these patients and then communication with patient families. A lot of the principles that are involved in the care of the neurotrauma patient um, are also applicable to other areas of neurosurgery and management of uh, neurocritical care patients, such as intracranial pressure management, management of seizures or status epilepticus, complication avoidance or management, and these carry over to uh, the management of other patients in, in neurosurgery. And the skills you develop um, when you have experience in neuro neurotrauma are useful no matter what area of neurosurgery you eventually end up practicing. You know, as we have a larger aging population um, in uh, the United States as well as globally, there's more incidence of subdural hematomas and hygromas. Most of us, um, even if you're not specialized in neurotrauma, take general call where you're frequently encounter trauma patients. And the neurosurgeon is really, you know, uh, still a, an authority in neurocritical care, even with the development of 
more neurologists going into neurocritical care. As neurosurgeons, we all get trained in neurocritical care. We all still have to know um, how to communicate with neurointensivists and also how to manage these patients if there's not a neurointensivist around um, or uh, cooperatively with the neurointensivist. And it's, you know, neurotrauma provides a great opportunity to see patients as they recover in the outpatient setting because a fair, you know, the vast majority of these patients actually do quite well. And even in the severe head trauma and, you know, uh, severe spinal cord injuries, um, a lot of these patients actually make uh, remarkable recoveries. So a little bit of an introduction to neurotrauma. As I alluded to, it's a very common uh, pathology we see in neurosurgery. And in fact, it's the oldest uh, neurosurgical subspecialty. Um, this is a picture of uh, uh, the Incas uh, doing a trephination. And, you know, some societies did trephinations both for religious reasons and spiritual reasons as well. But um, also they would do, uh, also do trephinations on, you know, warriors and, and combatants that has suffered head injuries. And if you actually look in ancient Greece, um, Homer's the Iliad and the Odyssey, for any of that have read it, you know, there's a litany of uh, head injuries as well as cervical spine injuries that are listed in, in and written about um, in, those, in, in those epics. And it's really the first literary source of head trauma. Uh, and you can see what the fatality rate was uh, then, which was basically almost 100%. So in the United States each year, and this is a little bit outdated data, that, um, it's, it's even more now, but you have over 2 million emergency department visits for head trauma. And now the vast majority of these are mild head traumas, but about one-tenth of these patients get hospitalized, so over 280,000, and there's about 50,000 deaths. Um, in the United States, falls are now the most common, followed by motor vehicle accidents. Globally, motor vehicle accidents, um, particularly in countries like India and China, are still kind of um, uh, more common than falls. Um, TBI costs every year are now approaching almost 100 billion uh, yearly in the US. And importantly, one third of all injury related deaths are caused by traumatic brain injury. Um, you know, if you look at demographics, you know, um, in kind of the early 2000s, uh, you'll see that there's actually an increasing incidence of TBI. And a lot of this has to do with kind of more recognition of mild traumatic brain injury and concussions, particularly in adolescents and sports related injuries, as well as um, in the elderly population. Um, and, but you'll see that, you know, while hospitalizations have kind of stayed relatively steady, deaths have slowly trended down um, over time in uh, traumatic brain injury. And there's actually been, contrary to popular belief, there's actually been significant improvements in outcome for severe TBI, despite the fact that we have very few uh, large randomized clinical trials that have um, shown benefit to, you know, med medications or um, different interventions. But um, really, you know, if you look at the mortality for severe traumatic brain injury in the 1930s and 1940s, it was upwards of 80%. And now for our most severely brain injured patients, it's down to less than 20%, really. Um, you know, for a really severely um, head injured patient, it's r roughly around 15 to 17%. Um, and one of the most effective, cost-effective surgical procedures is actually a craniotomy for an epidural hematoma, because these are patients that are usually young, um, usually haven't suffered significant underlying injury to the brain itself. And, you know, if this, if the epidural hematoma is not evacuated quickly enough, it will continue to expand and it will eventually cause um, them to, to die. But if you intervene early enough, you can dramatically uh, improve their outcome, you, and most of these patients will actually make a full and complete recovery if you catch them early enough. So it's important to realize that our improvements in TBI outcomes, um, which are dramatic if you compare it to, you know, uh, improvements in outcomes from for brain cancer or um, other neurosurgical diseases, uh, you know, the improvements in TBI out outcomes are, are quite good. Um, but many of these improvements have come from kind of uh, small incremental improvements in different areas of care for these patients, including trauma systems, uh, improvements in EMS and ED resuscitation, improvements in neurocritical care, improvements, uh, importantly, in post-TBI rehabilitation and adherence to guidelines-based management. There's really no one you know, silver bullet or one magic pill that has led to these improvements, but it's a combination of all these things together that's led to these dramatic improvements over time. Um, 
So a little bit about the classification of TBI. Um, you know, this is a little bit of a busy slide, but it's really just to highlight the fact that there are many different ways that we classify traumatic brain injury. One is on clinical severity, mechanism of injury is another, you know, whether it's a blunt head injury like a fall or motor vehicle accident versus something that's penetrating like a gunshot wound. Um, injury type is another way and radiographic classifications. In terms of injury type, we're really talking often about the pathoanatomical type of injury, whether it's an epidural hematoma, a subdural hematoma, subarachnoid hemorrhage, and all of these have varying different prognoses associated with them, as well as different um, amounts of underlying injury to the brain itself, such as, you know, diffuse axonal injury, where there's actually shearing of the axon um, them, themselves. And so this is really just to highlight the fact, ooh, oh, sorry. What happened there? Can you guys hear me still? Yeah, I can hear you. That's weird. Did you lose, did you lose something? Yeah. Can you guys see it still? That's weird. I just yeah. jumped over to my other screen. That's strange. Um, anyway, uh, so this is this is just to highlight the fact that really traumatic brain injury, while we talk about it kind of as being one disease, is really um, multiple different diseases all at the same time. Um, sorry, I'm just a little bit of an issue here. You guys can, uh, there we go. Okay, I'm back. So, you know, it's a very heterogeneous disease and it's really, that's one of the reasons why it's hard to do um, clinical research studies where we're investigating a particular therapeutic medication or a particular surgery, because we're really talking about multiple different diseases all lumped together under the rubric of, of traumatic brain injury. And so, this is kind of a somewhat famous slide because these are all patients that have the same Glasgow coma scale. So the same severity of head injury, yet they all have very different types of injuries. One's an epidural hematoma up here on the upper left versus a contusion. Upper right is someone with diffuse axonal injury, et cetera. And all of these patients have basically varying different prognoses dependent upon the different types of injury that they have. Um, So in terms of the pathophysiology of traumatic brain injury, um, as I alluded to, because traumatic brain injury is a very heterogeneous disease, um, there's many different aspects of the pathophysiology. One is just the pathoanatomical uh, uh, injury that the person has uh, sustained, whether it's a contusion or a hematoma, uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage, diffuse axonal injury, and often there's multiple of these in any one individual. It's very, uh, it's more often, uh, the case that somebody has multiple of these rather than one particular isolated type of injury. And this is just a schematic on the right showing that the, the um, basically the acceleration or the magnitude of the injury um, combined with how long that acceleration has occurred causes different types of injuries. And obviously the more, uh, more acceleration or de deceleration magnitude and the longer duration, the more severe the injury is going to be. And there's, as I alluded to, there's many different layers to the uh, pathophysiology of TBI, all the way down to the cellular level. And you know, don't try and memorize this structure, but this or this this diagram. But this is just to show that even at the level of the mitochondria and the cell membrane, the, the dysfunction that's going on at the neuronal level um, in in a patient with traumatic brain injury, there's calcium influx, there's failure of the sodium potassium um, ATPase transport pumps because of the fact that the mitochondria themselves are become dysfunctional. And all these things lead to kind of usually a, 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 a cascade of events that occur that result in cytotoxic swelling of the neurons themselves and the glia, which results in brain swelling and brain edema, edema and elevated intracranial pressure. So, Generally speaking, we talk about a primary injury and a traumatic brain injury. Um, and this is the injury that occurs at the moment of impact. It's the irreversible injury, either from you know, a contusion that has destroyed some brain tissue or uh, a hemorrhage in the brain that um, has occurred. And you know, there's nothing that you can be done to kind of reverse that particular injury. However, these primary injuries cause, can then cause um, a cascade of events, as I mentioned before, to occur, as well as there can be secondary insults that occur that lead to a secondary injury. And so what are these insults? 
things like hypotension, low blood pressure, or hypoxemia, low blood oxygen, decreased cerebral blood flow. So this happens almost always in somebody with a severe traumatic brain injury. And then elevated intracranial pressure, which will exacerbate all these things. It will lead to further decreased cerebral blood flow and decreased cerebral perfusion, cerebral ischemia, ischemia and can lead to cerebral herniation. Um, and all these things lead to what is called secondary injury. And so really a lot of our therapies in traumatic brain injury are really to avoid secondary injury. So to um, prevent the primary injury from getting worse and developing into a more severe form of brain injury um, from by mitigating all of these kind of factors uh, along the way. And so um, in terms of intracranial pressure, um, many of you are probably familiar with the Monroe Kelly Doctrine, which we learn in medical school. And this is just simply that the skull is a fixed uh, volume. It's a, it's a, you know, closed box, essentially. Um, and, you know, you have room for your brain parenchyma. You have some blood volume, which is in the arteries and the veins and the dural sinuses. And then you have CSF volume. And if you add something, whether it's a tumor or a hematoma, into that closed space, you're you know, increasing the amount of stuff in, in that box. And at first, you can compensate for that by decreasing the amount of cerebral spinal fluid in the brain or the amount of blood in the arteries and the veins. Um, but eventually you will run, start running into a point where you can no longer decrease those um, adequately to compensate. And as you start keep on increasing more volume into a fixed uh, space, you will invariably start to have an increase in pressure. And so that this pressure is your intracranial pressure. And eventually you'll get to a point, this inflection point where basically it skyrockets and it goes up dramatically. Now, why is that important? Well, it's important because if your intracranial pressure is going up and we'll talk about this a little bit later as well, um, your cerebral perfusion pressure and the amount of blood that you, and the amount of blood flow that you have going to your brain is directly correlated to both your mean arterial pressure and your intracranial pressure. And it's really your mean arterial pressure minus your intracranial pressure is your cerebral perfusion pressure. And why is that important? Well, that's important because if you have decreased cerebral blood flow for long and it's profound enough and long enough, you will eventually start to develop cerebral ischemia and cerebral infarction. And so that's what ultimately um, leads to the demise of many patients with uh, severe traumatic brain injury is either they have cerebral herniation from massively elevated ICP, and, which causes irreversible brainstem injury, or they develop decreased cerebral blood flow and decreased cerebral perfusion to the point where they have overwhelming cerebral ischemia and infarction. So we'll talk a little bit more about that later when we talk about management um, um, of ICP, but some just to go over some prognostic indicators, um, in traumatic brain injury, the most important prognostic indicators are age. So older patients in general tend to do less, although we tend to not to, uh, you know, we don't want to withhold treatment for patients that are older. And as technology is advanced and data has become better, we, you know, we find that older patients still can have good outcomes. It's just that obviously the older you are, the less likely you are to kind of bounce back from a traumatic brain injury that, and the injury that you've suffered the less kind of plastic your brain is. And so the recovery may be less full and it may take longer. Um, Glasgow coma scale is important. It's important to realize that this is after, after resuscitation has occurred. And once you've, you know, reestablished adequate blood pressure, once you've, you know, in the case of a severe traumatic brain injury, somebody, you know, once you've had intubated the patient and oxygenated them, and that um, it's often very hard to tell um, in the initial setting, you know, what somebody's prognosis is going to be because, you know, you're in the setting where you are having to resuscitate the patient and they may have ongoing hypotension or hypoxia. They may have increasing mass effect procedures or medications that are confounding it. Um, somebody that has a declining GTS, you have to kind of think about all those things. Um, those things could all be compounding and it might not just be from the actual brain injury itself. And then the pupillary exam is also an important prognosticator. Um, somebody that has uh, bilaterally uh, right reactive pupils is somebody that, generally speaking, has salvageable brain function. Somebody that has a unilateral fixed and dilated pupil is somebody that has 
most likely a mask lesion that is now starting to have uncle herniation. That patient, you know, in general will probably not do as well as somebody that has bilaterally reactive pupils, but they still probably have a salvageable brain function and that's somebody you would need to intervene on emergently. Somebody with fixed and bilateral, uh, fixed and dilated pupils bilaterally is much less likely to do well, particularly if that's been the, the case for several hours, because that's a sign of um, brainstem dysfunction. Doesn't necessarily mean we won't intervene upon them. You know, if it's just just occurred that somebody, and particularly somebody that's young, that's somebody that we could still potentially save. But um, obviously, the longer it's going on, the, the more likely it is that that's an irreversible injury. So in terms of prevention of secondary injury, these are modifiable uh, prognosticators um, that each of them individually and in combination can uh, result in uh, uh, worsened prognosis for patients. And so these are the things we kind of focus on and try and either prevent or correct as quickly as possible. So hypotension leading to brain ischemia, hypoxia also leading to brain ischemia, hyperventilation. Now, you, you know, we all learned that hyperventilation decreases intracranial pressure, and that's true, and it's actually one of the most powerful ways to do so um, by essentially um, decreasing uh, um, the, the um, arterial size in the, in the brain and thereby decreasing the amount of blood in the brain. Um, and as we showed in the Monroe Kelly Doctrine, that will reduce the overall volume in the, in the skull and reduce the ICP. But if you do that too much, as you can imagine, um, you're going to constrict the vessels enough that you have decreased cerebral blood flow leading to cerebral ischemia. So you can actually make things worse by over uh, hyperventilating somebody. So a little is often good in the setting of somebody with severe traumatic brain injury, but too much is bad. And then, um, you know, herniation. We obviously want to uh, address and evacuate any mass lesions or treat any cerebral edema as, as uh, expeditiously as we can to prevent cerebral herniation. So a little bit about the management of traumatic brain injury. So any patient that has a trauma, um, and this applies to patients with head injuries as well as spinal cord injuries, we always start off with the same way. We always start off with airway, breathing, and circulation. Um, and that's because if you know we can't, don't uh, manage the airway, we don't uh, protect the airway, um, we don't ensure the patient is being ventilated, obviously in a severe traumatic brain injury, they might not be breathing spontaneously, so we need to put them on a mechanical ventilation, and they don't have adequate circulation, nothing else that we do in terms of both surgical and non-surgical man management is going to matter. We have to address all those things to not only keep the patient alive, but to ensure that the brain is not further injured um, from uh, hypotension or hypoxia. Um, the next is really the disability or deficit, or as I like to call it, the, the neuro exam. Um, and then the last is exposure environment. You know, we always want to, once we've kind of addressed these immediate concerns, we want to make sure that we then look at, you know, very carefully the, uh, the entire uh, patient, make sure that, you know, we're examining for other injuries that may have been missed on kind of the very initial primary survey. What is paramount in all of this, particularly for as neurosurgeons taking care of neurotrauma patients is there's many different services. There's many different folks involved in the management of these patients acutely. That's the ED team, the trauma team, the ICU team, and for patients that need to go to the OR, OR, and anesthesia, and really good and efficient communication, both quick communication, but obviously, uh, you know, making sure that that communication is efficient and that we are not missing information, that we are uh, communicating as effectively as possible is paramount. So. Who do you, should we, you be suspicious for that has a TBI? So obviously any patient that has the signs of head or facial trauma, any patient that has loss of consciousness or a seizure, um, you know, if you have loss of consciousness, that in and of itself means you have a head injury. Even if the patient is totally wide awake without symptoms, if you've had loss of consciousness, it meant you had a mild traumatic brain injury by definition. You know, you can have a mild traumatic brain injury without losing consciousness, but if you have loss of consciousness, you've definitely had one. Um, Appropriate mechanisms, so a motor vehicle accident, a fall or assault, uh, an elderly patient or anybody that's anticoagulated, you have to be highly suspicious. They will often um, have maybe even a trivial uh, uh, trauma or not even remember the trauma and can, can suffer a head injury or an intracranial hemorrhage. Um, always suspect concomitant spine trauma, particularly cervical, particularly the more severe TBI, the more likely they are to have a concomitant spine injury. And then in 
or severely injured uh, head, head injury patients or those that have basal or skull fractures or other criteria such as um, significant facial fractures like the fort fractures, we have to be concerned about blunt cerebrovascular injury. And then patients that have penetrating uh, head injuries like gunshot wounds, there's a very high incidence of penetrating cerebrovascular injury. So these are all things that we have to think about in these patients. Um, there are numerous guidelines uh, for management of traumatic brain injury patients. It's probably, if not the most evidence-based subspecialty of neurosurgery, one of them. Um, and there are guidelines for the pre-hospital management, guidelines for the management of severe traumatic brain injury, pediatric severe TBI, which was recently updated with third edition um, a year ago, um, guidelines for the surgical management of TBI, combat-related head trauma, and then multiple different societies that are involved in formulating these guidelines and coming up with consensus um, statements on these as well. However, it, there's still only one, only one level one guideline in all of uh, the management for severe traumatic brain injury, and that's to not use steroids for the acute management of traumatic brain injury. And really specifically, this is not to use steroids for ICP or, or edema control. It's, uh, most of the ICP and edema, or most of the cerebral edema that forms after traumatic brain injury is cytotoxic and not vasogenic, um, a lot, and that's related to those uh, dysfunction of the mitochondria and that's kind of the cellular um, disruption that occurs after a traumatic brain injury. And so steroids aren't really effective in managing that. And um, a very large trial um, called the CRASH trial showed that actually uh, using steroids routinely for severe traumatic brain injury results in increased mortality. So again, this is just a kind of a schematic of, you know, there's many different guidelines, lots of textbooks um, related to neurotrauma. Um, really our goals when we are managing patients with severe traumatic brain injury is for the most part to just kind of keep things in the normal range, doing things that are often prophylactic or that are targeting kind of super normal levels um, of all, most of the most of those have all been kind of debunked. And for the most part, really what we're trying to do is just try and keep the patient as physiologically normal as possible. So trying to keep, make sure they're not um, hypoxemic, uh, making sure that their uh, PCO2 is, uh, is in, in the normal range. They're not, you know, excessively hyperventilated or uh, hypercarbic, that their blood pressure is adequate um, and that their cerebral perfusion is, is, is normal, their temperature is normal, their glucose is normal, all of these things. So, you know, one of kind of the imp most important things um, to address and to avoid or to treat in somebody that has a traumatic brain injury. Um, you know, as part of a kind of a consensus group that looked at uh, a traumatic brain injury bundle, like we have bundles for placing central lines or ventilator management in patients. And we went through all of the guidelines and, and, and at that time and came up with five main, main points um, to address in traumatic brain injury. And if you can do all five of these, uh, then you're well ahead of the game in, in managing these patients. So the first is to avoid and treat hypoxia, avoid and treat hypotension, avoid excessive hyperventilation, evaluate and treat intracranial hypertension, and not to use steroids routinely in these patients. And so, you know, managing these patients is really, you know, uh, there's multiple links. There's the first responders, the ED, the trauma center, the OR if necessary, ICU and rehab. And all these are equally important. And if you're lacking in any one of these, um, patients don't do well. So it's important that all along the way, um, everybody's uh, kind of managing these patients as much as possible according to guidelines-based management. So in terms of avoiding secondary injuries, as I mentioned before, um, these are kind of the most important things we can do and the most um, modifiable as well. So avoiding hypotension, hypoxemia, hyperventilation. So moving on to intracranial pressure. So uh, as we talked about, uh, the Monroe Kelly Doctrine, um, and what are some clinical signs of elevated ICP? And I also mentioned low cerebral perfusion pressure because as I mentioned before, cerebral perfusion pressure is just the mean arterial pressure minus the intracranial pressure. So if you have elevated ICP for somebody that has the same mean arterial pressure, that means you're gonna also have low cerebral perfusion pressure. So when I talk about intracranial pressure monitoring, I also 
consider that to be cerebral perfusion pressure monitoring because you're, off, you're always going to be measuring somebody's mean arterial pressure at the same time. That's really what, you know, we not only want a low intracranial pressure, but we want an adequate cerebral perfusion pressure. So some of the signs of elevated intracranial pressure are going to be headache or nausea, vomiting, and somebody that's awake, agitation. That is very important, particularly in anybody, any neurosurgical patient. Um, you'll often see, oh, the patient was agitated, you know, so we sedated them. Well, agitation is a sign of increased intracranial pressure or often something bad going on in the brain. It's very important not to minimize that and to realize that that's a patient that, you you know, you might want to get a scan on them before you start sedating them. You might want to see what why is it that they're agitated because um, sometimes it can be that there's, you know, increased intracranial pressure causing that or, you know, a new hemorrhage or something. Uh, decreased mental status, obviously, um, is a sign of elevated ICP, coma, uh, motor posturing, so somebody with abnormal flexion or extensor posturing, pupillary dilation, uh, and, and decreased pupillary reactivity to light. So in terms of uh, intracranial pressure monitoring, there are multiple, this is from the fourth edition of the Brain Trauma Foundation Guidelines for the management of patients with severe traumatic brain injury. And there are multiple different guidelines that uh, are related to intracranial pressure monitoring. And so the management of a severe traumatic brain injury patient, what using information from intracranial pressure monitoring is recommended to reduce in-hospital and two-week post-injury mortality. Um, using guidelines-based recommendation, re recommendations for cerebral perfusion pressure monitoring, so the only way you can monitor cerebral perfusion pressure is to monitor intracranial pressure, that's also recommended to decrease two-week mortality. Um, with this new addition of the guidelines, they actually modified kind of the threshold for intracranial pressure um, to 22. So basically, it's been shown that patients, severe, severe traumatic brain injury patients that have sustained intracranial pressures over 22 um, have, an, have increased mortality. And so that is really the target that we use to treat nowadays in severe traumatic brain injury. We want to try and keep their intracranial pressure less than 22. Again, it's not, there's no real magic number. Some patients may tolerate 25 as long as their cerebral perfusion pressure is okay. Um, some may like, you know, 20, but it's in that range of 20 to 25. And, and we, you know, for simplicity's sake, we tend to pick one number and um, the number that is most uh, most often associated with worsening uh, mortality uh, is 22 in, in the literature. So, And then in terms of cerebral perfusion pressure, we really want to try and keep their cerebral perfusion pressure at least 60. And in the guidelines, it says between 60 and 70, because if we actually try and push it too high, if we are too aggressive about pushing their cerebral perfusion pressure up over 70 by giving them fluids or... Um, you know, keeping their intravascular volume high by giving them transfusions, we will actually often cause more harm than good because we cause increased respiratory um, problems, usually in the form of um, ARDS, um, you know, acute respiratory distress syndrome. So really we want to keep the cerebral perfusion pressure high enough um, and 60 is the, the limit we use. And the reason we use that limit is if it's under 50, you actually start to develop cerebral ischemia and it's been shown that if you target 60, that you don't dip down under 50 very often. But if you target 50, there is a pretty significant amount of time that somebody will, will live under 50. So um, really 60 is kind of the, the, the number we target. Um, you know, if their body is allowing them to hang out, at, you know, wanting them to hang out at 80 or 85 and their intracranial pressures is fine, then, you know, we don't correct that down to less than 70, but we also don't try and push it up over 70. Um, unnecessarily. Um, there have been, you know, there, there was a, a, a trial in 2012 called the Best Trip Trial, which actually looked at empiric treatment versus ICP monitoring in uh, patients in uh, Bolivia and Ecuador. Um, and they did it there because there they don't routine, or at the time they didn't routinely use ICP monitor, monitors and managing their patients. And this kind of caused a you know, bunch of consternation in the severe traumatic brain injury world because this trial showed actually no difference in a 21 composite score of mortality at six months in these patients. But it's important to realize that it really wasn't a trial of monitoring ICP uh, versus not monitoring ICP because 
even the patients in the empiric treatment were being monitored in terms of their clinical exam and their CT scans, and they were all being treated for inter elevated intracranial pressure um, as if they had it. And so really what this was, was just treating a, a, a trial of looking at different algorithms um, for treating patients with intracranial pressure. And there's also, there was a, a lot of, there was high internal validity, but it lacked external, external validity because a lot of these patients were being, they were using uh, parenchymal ICP monitors and not external ventricular drains, which we'll talk about. Um, and there was also no real post ICU rehab um, that went on in these patients. And so there was actually a uh, uh, decreased mortality in the ICP monitoring group while they were in the ICU. And then basically once they left the ICU, all that kind of went away, presumably because um, that, that benefit was lost because there was not really a uh, good subacute or um, acute rehab. And subsequent to this, there's been multiple studies that have shown that um, in, in large population databases that patients that um, where ICP monitoring um, has been undertaken and guidelines-based management of these patients, including ICP monitoring, is um, used that these patients with severe traumatic brain injury do better when that is the case. Um, and so um, it is really, you know, intracranial pressure monitoring is really kind of the bedrock of severe traumatic brain injury management. And um, if you, there, this was a study where basically they looked at the rate of intracranial pressure monitoring in severe traumatic brain injury patients at different level one trauma centers. And the more often severe traumatic brain injury patients had intracranial pressure monitored, the lower their mortality was. And, you know, whether that's the fact of the monitoring itself, or it's just the fact that not only are they monitoring the intracranial pressure, but they're also doing everything else according to guidelines-based management, and all of that is what lowers, lowers their mortality. Um, Nobody really knows, but certainly the, the centers that monitor intracranial pressure more often have reduced mortality. As well as just the, the number, um, the waveform from an intracranial pressure monitor is often gives us um, uh, very useful information. So somebody that has normal intracranial pressure, or really what this is, is somebody with normal compliance, um, their waveform will look like at the top here, where the P1, their, the percussion wave is the highest wave, followed by the P2 wave, and then the P3 wave. And then somebody that has decreased compliance, which is more often going to be seen as somebody with elevated intracranial pressure, it will look more like um, kind of like a peak pattern or a triangle pattern where P2 is higher than P1. So, you know, if I see, if I have two different patients, both with an intracranial pressure, say, of like 20, I'm going to be much more worried about the patient where their waveform looks like the bottom because they basically have no compliance in their brain. Essentially, any increase in edema or any increase in the blood in their brain, whether that's blood in the vessels, so higher, you know, blood pressure, um, th that patient is going to have no way to compensate for that. And their intracranial pressure is going to go much higher than somebody that has a waveform like the one at the top where they have better compliance and are going to still be better able to accommodate, you know, small increases in the volume in their skull. So patients that are at risk for elevated ICP include patients with severe and moderate head trauma, younger patients. So younger patients have fuller brains, smaller ventricles. They have less ability to compensate for increases in volume in the skull. They also have more inflammation and edema. Patients with ongoing cerebral ischemia, cerebral ischemia leads to edema, which leads to increased intracranial pressure, which leads to decreased cerebral, cerebral perfusion pressure, which leads to more cerebral ischemia. So you can see how this is a vicious cycle. And really a lot of our treatment in this case is to break that cycle at some point so that um, they no longer have uh, worsening ischemia, worsening edema. So, you know, somebody that's hypotensive or hypoxic, correcting those things can decrease their cerebral ischemia and thereby break that cycle. Patient that has polytraumas are more often gonna have uh, those potential secondary um, events or secondary insults. And so that's a patient that's at risk for elevated ICP. Patients that have mass lesions such as a hematoma or in a non-trauma patient, a patient with a tumor. Patients that have hydrocephalus. So if you have you know, a bunch of IVH, uh, say from a traumatic injury that can lead to obstructive hydrocephalus, they're more likely to have elevated intracranial pressure. So um, let me just double check what time it is. So um, quickly, I'll go through a couple 
uh, you know, kind of more nuanced uh, aspects of intracranial pressure monitoring. So, you know, there are different ways we can monitor intracranial pressure. Um, and when we say ICP monitor, we're often talking about either about an external ventricular drain, which is put into the ventricular space and actually act, you know, drains cerebros uh, cerebrospinal fluid by gravity out of the brain. Um, and we monitor basically the intracranial pressure based upon that, that fluid column, or we use fiber optic um, monitors, which are parenchymal monitors, which are small fiber optic cables that are usually uh, placed through a small burr hole into the brain parenchyma, and uh, which which one's better? Well, people have looked at this, and actually external ventricular drains are really our gold standard. They have a bigger advantage because not only are they a monitor, but they can also treat in elevated intracranial pressure by diverting cerebral spinal fluid. Um, so why don't we just use that all the time? Well, there are higher risks and higher complications associated with EVD. Um, there's a higher rate of malpositioning. There's a higher rate of hemorrhage. So it's anywhere up to 40% if you're looking at even the smallest hemorrhage, but really significant hemorrhages are about one to 1.5% for EVDs and they're much smaller for parenchymal monitors. Um, there's a much higher risk of infection with external ventricular drains. Um, uh, parenchymal monitors almost never get infected. Um, and EVDs typically have a higher rate of malfunction due to either malposition or significant IVH. However, it is still our gold standard because unlike the parenchymal monitor, we can actually treat um, elevated intracranial pressure using an external ventricular drain. And so um, people have actually looked at, um, you know, if you place an EVD, you know, you can keep it in kind of two different you can monitor uh, intracranial pressure two different ways. One is you can keep the EVD open, let the spinal fluid drain, and then intermittently check their intracranial pressure, whether that's every 15 minutes, every 30 minutes, every hour, um, or keep it closed and only open it when the, elevate, when the intracranial pressure is elevated. That's been looked at as well. Um, and basically those patients that, have, that are managed with the EVD left open, even though you don't get you know, a second to second or minute to minute measurement of the intracranial pressure, the intracranial pressure burden in those patients tends to be lower than if the EVD is kept closed. Um, so the way we manage uh, patients with uh, ICP monitors or brain tissue oxygen monitors, uh, which we probably won't have time to get to in terms of brain tissue oxygen monitoring, but um, we manage these patients typically in what's called a tiered fashion. And uh, this is, these are two kind of important uh, uh, basically consensus statements that were, they were put out, which have algorithms associated with them. Um, I'll have the references uh, uh, are, are here. And, you know, uh, anybody that wants to look these up, I, you know, I can give my slides to them, obviously, and can look these up. But basically, what this alludes to is that there is a, is a tier progression on how we manage these patients from tier zero to tier three. Tier zero is basically all the, the, the basic uh, TBI care that we do for patients with severe traumatic brain injury is not really dependent upon their intracranial pressure. And it's kind of all the things that we do that are non-invasive for the most part, you know, admission to the ICU, somebody that's in a coma, intubation and mechanical ventilation, serial neurological exams, keeping their head of bed elevated to, you know, and it, there have been studies that show that a head of bed of 30 to 45 degrees is kind of the sweet spot in terms of decreasing intracranial pressure and allowing cerebral perfusion pressure, pressure to be maintained, analgesia for pain, sedation to prevent agitation and ventilator asynchrony, managing their temperature, thing, all these things. Tier one is really where we start to intervene to actually uh, do things to lower somebody's elevated intracranial pressure. And, you know, these don't have to be done in a sequential form. We're really doing all these things all at the same time. And so maintaining their cerebral perfusion pressure, using analgesia and sedation to lower the ICP, those are kind of mainstays. The next is really, you know, making sure that their uh, PaCO2 is at the low end of normal. Again, we want, you know, that will decrease the, the size of the vessels in the brain and thereby decrease the intracranial pressure, but we won't want to do it too aggressively because we don't want to um, cause them to become uh, ischemic and thereby worsen their intracranial pressure and potentially lead to uh, infarction. 
we giving them hyperosmolar therapy, whether that's mannitol or hypertonic saline, placing an EVD if we ha don't have one yet to drain CSF, um, you know, making sure that they're on anti-seizure prophylaxis so that they, they don't develop seizures, which can also uh, result in increased uh, ICP. And then, you know, if somebody's ICP is still not controlled, you know, we really want to, you know, make sure we re-examine them, probably repeat a head CT. If they have a mass lesion, obviously cons consider surgical options and then progress to tier two, which is kind of more aggressively um, targeting their, their uh, low PCO2. And then starting to do other things that are, that are more invasive, such as uh, giving them a test dose of neuromuscular paralysis um, and also doing what's called a MAP challenge, which is basically to see um, how, what their cerebral autoregulation is like and whether or not uh, changing the, their blood pressure is gonna reduce their, their intracranial pressure. So, you know, I won't get into this too much, but basically tier two and tier three therapies um, are really where we start to get into uh, therapies that don't have as much evidence behind them. They, they, they all work to a certain degree. The question is whether or not they really um, lead to uh, improved outcomes. And the reason for this is anybody that it starts to get into this tier two, tier three ther therapies are really patients where they have a severe injury and they've developed refractory intracranial pressure, um, elevated intracranial pressure. And these patients are in general not going to do as well. Um, and we can do things to, to let them survive. Or, or, but, the, you know, these are patients that are going to have almost always some sort of long-term sequelae or some long-term deficit from their brain injury, even if they survive um, the acute event. Um, and so tier three therapies are really what we call salvage therapies, which include hypothermia, uh, pentobar coma, and secondary decompressive craniectomy. Um, more and more, uh, the literature sent, tends to support um, uh, secondary decompressive craniectomy as probably the most effective of all of these. We know it dramatically reduces somebody into intracranial pressure, and there's some it does uh, decrease mortality. The question is. Um, you know, what percentage of those patients actually have a good functional outcome, and it, it, it's small. Really, you're moving patients from the dead category and moving them into uh, vegetative and severely uh, disabled, but there is a percentage of that severely disabled that is still independent in the home, and, and those patients, you know, this is where talking with the families is very important to see what, what level of um, kind of outcome they, they would accept and deem to be a good outcome. Um, Pentobarcoma is also effective. Um, hypothermia has kind of uh, now been uh, relegated more to um, kind of a last ditch therapy because it's not really been shown to um, be that effective um, and it has the most complications usually associated with it as well. Um, so I'll skip kind of this. Um, 820 right now. Uh, let me just go to uh, a quick case um, so that we can. Here, <laughs> can see I got a lot of got a lot of stuff if people want to take a look at it. But um, just uh, some take-home points: uh, TBI is a heterogeneous disease. Um, you know, be suspicious for a TBI in patients that have altered mental status, loss of consciousness, high-velocity mechanism. Um, elderly and intoxicated patients. Intoxicated is a very important one that, you know, about almost half of patients that have a traumatic brain injury in the United States have some level of uh, alcohol intoxication. So uh, highly associated. Avoid hypotension, avoid hypoxia, avoid hyperventilation, uh, too much hyperventilation at least. Um, rapid transport to a trauma center for neurosurgical evaluation and definitive care, obviously. Early surgical treatment for patients with mass lesions, intensive care and monitoring to avoid secondary injuries and evaluate and treat elevated ICP. And the corollary to that is also treat low cerebral perfusion pressure and low brain tissue oxygen if you're monitoring the brain tissue oxygen. Um, in terms of a case, a good case is this one. Um, uh, this was a 26 year old that came to Elmhurst Hospital and he was a pedestrian hit by a car. Um, he had headache, nausea, vomiting. Um, uh, following hitting his head on the windshield. His initial GCS was 14. He was confused. He has 
on the scan, the CT scan here on the left, you can see that there's a subdural on the left. You know, he's young, so he has a pretty full brain. He, he's got some mass effect, some midline shift towards the right. Um, importantly, he has this skull fracture, which goes right down the midline. And that is often a scary thing when we see that because we that's often associated with uh, injury to the superior sagittal sinus, which can cause a significant amount of bleeding. Um, so when he was in the CT scanner, he actually vomited three times and his neurological, he had a neurological decline down to GCS3, started dilating his left pupil, became bradycardic and hypertensive. So anybody that sees, you know, bradycardic hypertensive, hypertension, that's, you know, Cushing sign, um, that's a sign of, you know, elevated ICP and he has his left dilated pupil. And so the eye never lies. And so in general, if you have a dilated pupil on the left, he probably developed a mass lesion on the left. And so we saw that he had that subdural before. So the thought is that that is now either expanding or he's got massively elevated, uh, massively increased cerebral edema on that side, uh, leading to his neurological decline. So he was emergently intubated, uh, put his head up, we mildly hyperventilated him and we gave him empiric hyperosmolar therapy to uh, decrease uh, his, hopefully his intracranial pressure. But because we knew that there was a mass lesion uh, on his initial head CT, he was also taken emergently to the OR for a left decompressive hemocraniectomy and evacuation of his acute subdural. In the OR, the subdural was successfully evacuated, but then he had rapid swelling of his left hemisphere um, so much so that it was almost turning out of the, the, the brain defect. So, uh, you know, in the OR, his head was elevated, he was hyperventilated, he was, he was given, we placed a uh, ventriculostomy. Uh, if you have time, we will often do an ultrasound to make sure there's not a hemorrhage right in the, in the in under, underlying the uh, brain surface that we can evacuate right then and there. Um, he was taken immediately for a post-op head CT and he had this very, very large epidural hematoma. And this is what, why I mentioned that skull fracture because this is coming from his superior sagittal sinus. And so he was taken immediately back to the OR to evacuate that. Um, and uh, that was evacuated successfully and post-operatively, uh, he was managed very aggressively in our ICU. And he actually had, um, refractory elevated ICP that was refractory to tier one and tier two therapies. He was on paralytics and, you know, the, basically the, you know, every you know, people in the ICU were saying, you know, to the family that, you know, he's not going to do well and what, you know, they were kind of expecting him to not pull through. But, um, you know, I knew from looking at his head CT that, you know, he didn't have any infarcts. He had, you know, some small uh, areas of, of uh, contusion in the frontal lobes his brainstem looked good. And so this is a patient that at his age, if we can manage his ICP and keep him from developing infarcts, you know, he actually has a chance to, to do quite well. And, you know, the swelling is not going to go on forever. It usually peaks around day four or day five. It can sometimes last up to day seven. And as long as we maintain an adequate cerebral perfusion pressure, prevent him from developing worsening cerebral ischemia infarction, um, he has a chance to pull through. So uh, this is a patient that actually used uh, barbiturate coma. Um, and the reason why I used it is I gave him one dose of it and his ICP dramatically dropped. And I knew that based upon kind of the, how, how many days it had been since his injury that I probably only needed to, a couple days of him in a barbiturate coma um, to get through and kind of get over the hump. And um, Actually, that managed uh, the barbiturate coma it worked very well. We only actually had to give him, I believe, the one dose, and it, he had sustained ICP control for the next several days. He had a prolonged course where he was comatose for 16 days. He developed ARDS. He had needed a trach and a peg, and he was in the hospital for almost two months. And he was discharged in acute TBI rehab. But a year later, he had survived. He had gone to you know, as I mentioned, acute TBI rehab, and he'd gotten his cranioplasty, gotten his bone flap put back, and actually had dinner with him and his family about a year afterwards, after he had learned to walk again, and had gone back to work, and had basically no deficit. So this is kind of, you know, doesn't happen for everybody, but this happens for enough patients that have these severe brain injuries, that this is why we do what we do, and why we kind of, you know, throw all the resources at the hospital at these patients, because 
you know, if you have one patient like this, you know, you feel like you've, you know, kind of, this is what all your training was for. So anyway, with that, um, I will finish and say thank you so that we have some time for questions. I know that was a lot of information, so don't feel like you have to <laughs> get it all in one fell swoop. That was great. So I, I, I like when you show those um, examples of the potential disaster that turns out well, because it really does give you hope when you see these seemingly devastated patients who walk back in a year later. Yeah. I mean, you know, for for every patient that doesn't do well, there's more patients that do do well. And I think that's, you know, one of the things that to get across to, you know, uh, people going into the field or interested about it, you know, uh, you, you know, you hear sometimes a lot of doom and gloom, <laughs> but, the, you know, by and large, you know, the vast majority of patients with traumatic brain injury do exceedingly well. And even those with severe traumatic brain injury, um, you know, now the survival rate's 80%. And of those 80%, the vast majority of them actually do quite well. Um, and there's the occasion of one like that one where, you know, they have kind of a lot of things stacked against them, but they still pull through um, and, and do and do very well. So. Does anyone have any questions? Stunned silence. <laughs> All right, well, thank you. Thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Nope. Um, you can yes, actually, I have a question. Sorry to interrupt, Professor. Sure. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, no. Yeah, so um, Dr. Hinman, I, I was wondering if uh, ICP should be the, the main variable to conduct the, the management of this uh, traumatic brain injury patients, um, or if there any um, more accurate or that will uh, lead us to a, a better outcome to be in the clinical practice? Mm -hmm. Well, certainly the, the, the most important thing is how the patient's doing clinically. So, you know, if you have a neurological exam that you can follow, um, you know, how, how their neurological exam is progressing is by far the most important. The issue is obviously in these patients with severe traumatic brain injury, oftentimes their neurological exam is poor and they're in a coma. And so that's where managing, you know, monitoring intracranial pressure, getting serial imaging, um, where that is very useful information. Um, it certainly is probably out of, you know, we talk about multimodality monitoring, you know, which, you know, means intracranial pressure, blood tissue, oxygen, microdialysis. I think, you know, intracranial pressure is probably the most important of those. It's certainly been the standard and kind of the, the bedrock of severe TBI management for multiple different de multiple decades. And that's because, you know, if you can manage the intracranial pressure and you can manage the through perfusion pressure adequately, a significant, that's going to be good enough for a significant portion of the, of the population. Uh, I didn't have time to go into it, but the reason why more and more um, we're monitoring brain tissue oxygen uh, as well is there is about 10% of severe traumatic brain injury patients where they'll have a normal intracranial pressure, but they'll actually have cerebral ischemia that's ongoing um, despite an, a normal cerebral perfusion pressure and a normal ICP. And that's um, because they, you know, for whatever reason that particular patient wants a higher cerebral perfusion pressure, they probably have ongoing you know, either respiratory issue or maybe a low uh, hemoglobin, or maybe they just have uh, more cerebral edema that's um, causing them to be uh, have uh, cerebral ischemia. And that's rare that the, the patient where monitoring their brain tissue oxygen is probably uh, additionally important. And, um, you know, the question is, how do you know who falls into that group if you're not mon monitoring brain tissue oxygen? Well, you don't really. <laughs> and so, you know, the, the BOOST-2 trial, which is a, was a phase two trial where they managed patients, they had patients, they both got ICP monitors and brain tissue oxygen monitors in one group. They only had intracranial pressure to uh, manage the patients. In the other group, they had the data from the ICP monitor and the brain tissue oxygen monitor to manage the patients. And what that showed is if you actually use both intracranial pressure and brain tissue oxygen, there was a mortality benefit um, to the patients, and not only was it a mortality benefit, but it was the the there was the survivors tended to be 
they tended to have a better, good outcome. So it wasn't that you were just causing people to survive that were then vegetative. It was those patients ended up actually having <clears throat> very good outcomes. Um, and so now there's a there's a phase three trial, boost three, to see if that is still valid with a much larger group of, of subjects. But um, you know, if that holds up, then you know, not only will intracranial pressure monitoring be standard of care, but brain tissue oxygen monitoring will be standard of care. And, you know, a lot, many places around in North America and in, and in Europe are already using brain tissue oxygen monitoring, um, but, you know, it's not yet really risen to the level of standard of care, um, like intracranial pressure monitoring. Well, thank you very much. For... Answer, but yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Yeah, yeah, no problem. All right, well, thank you everyone for joining tonight. It was another great session. Uh, next week, we have Dr. Germano up uh, talking about radiosurgery and advances in radiosurgery for oncological disease in the brain. So thanks again for joining. We'll see you next week. And thanks, Dr. Hickman, for your time this evening. Thank you.